uh, there was a, a young boy who was fishing, and an, uh, an older gentleman was on the other side of the lake, and he was watching this young boy fish. And he was catching this large fish, and he was throwing them back in. And, and he was just keeping these small fish. And so after a while, the elder man went over to this young boy and said, I, I couldn't help but notice you were catching these great big fish, and you were throwing them back in, and you were only saving the small ones. And he said, well, he said, I only have a seven-inch frying pan. <laughs> and see, sometimes our expectation is too small. And we miss out on the bigger things that God wants to do because we have a small paradigm, a small mindset, a negative mindset, a, a, a small vision. And God wants us to expand. And I believe that today in our lives that God has something bigger. God has something greater. God wants us to arise. Amen. Cross over and possess the land. And I believe that you are on a journey. I believe that I'm on a journey and that we're going somewhere. Why? Because God is in control of our lives. We are not left to the circumstances and the happenstances of life, but God has a sovereign plan for us. But I want to help you to understand something, that it doesn't always work out the way we think or the plan and the, the process isn't always as... Um, uh, comfortable as we would like. So this morning I want to share with you some wisdom, wisdom from the wilderness. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. God has some lessons he wants to teach you. And uh, we have the scripture right up on the screen. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. You shall remember. The wilderness has been God's university for many of his choicest servants. The Lord has used the wilderness to teach his people and to train them for success. The Lord has used the wilderness to be a proving ground for growth and maturity for God's people. It is a place where we learn to grow in grace. God, throughout the Bible, the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, has led his people in the, into the wilderness to train them, to mature them, to develop them. We've seen this in the life of Moses. Moses, although he was trained and skilled in all the wisdom and the literature of Egypt, second in command, in the nation in the land of Egypt God took him into the wilderness for 40 years to train him to prepare him for even a greater purpose we see the life of David David even though he was anointed to be the king of Israel he is on the run he's in the wilderness in caves and dens hiding out from Saul but it's it was in the wilderness that God forged and fashioned David's mighty men. We know Elijah spent time in the wilderness. John the Baptist, the Bible tells us that he was in the wilderness for a period of time. And even Jesus spent time in the wilderness. On my first visit to the Holy Land in 2013, we took a two-mile hike into the wilderness. And that is one of the pictures that I took. Two-mile journey. For those of you that are going, uh, this is not on the itinerary if you're getting nervous about a two-mile journey into the wilderness. But we went into the wildernesses, but this was only one of them. There are over 20 wildernesses in the land of the Bible. 
The wilderness that we went to is in the southern part. This was Beersheba. This is where Hagar wandered after being uh, sent away by Sarah. This is also where Elijah fled to escape Jezebel. Now, you have to understand the wilderness is not only a sandy wasteland, but it is a barren and a rocky place. We literally climbed up rocks, looked over cliffs. We experienced the dry conditions of the wilderness firsthand. But we were only there for an hour or so, and it was rough. But if you would multiply this months and even years, if you would add in windstorms, flash floods, cold, heat, extreme and dire conditions, the wilderness can be seemingly unbearable. For you and I, the wilderness, and for Christians, the, the wilderness is a picture for us of hardship, suffering, and privation. It is those seasons in our Christian journey, it, uh, it's those times when we go through lack, hardship, and difficulty. You know, we all go through wilderness experiences. And that's what we, we've, we've termed it or we've, we've called it. Uh, if you've read any literature, any uh, teaching on the subject, and you might have heard it, uh, some would say, I'm in the wilderness. Obviously, it doesn't mean literally, but it means it figuratively. And the truth of the matter is, if you are walking with God, God will use the wilderness in your life to teach you valuable lessons. But some Christians don't want to accept the wilderness. They don't want the wilderness. It's all blessing. It's all good times. It's all victory. It's all happy go lucky times. But that's not realistic faith. That's not what the Bible tells us. But Moses, David, Elijah, John the Baptist, Jesus, the early church, and the church throughout history has experienced wilderness, suffering. You and I will go through it. The question is not will we, but when we. <laughs> when will we? The reality of it is we will all go through the wilderness. So we have to ask, what can we learn? What will the wilderness, what can the wilderness teach us? How can it result in spiritual growth? I want to look briefly. I want to look at three things that the wilderness can teach us. And I, then I want to invite you to the front. Then I want to pray for you. Now, before we, we look any further, I want you to go to the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Luke 1, verse 80. When you're there, say amen. Luke 1, verse 80. Look what it says. This is about John the Baptist. So the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the deserts. He was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Wow. I don't know if you, if you appreciate that verse of Scripture, but the Bible says that he was in the deserts and he grew strong in the spirit. Wow. You can grow strong in your desert experiences. And the Bible says that he was in the desert till his manifestation to Israel. Another translation says he experienced the stirrings of the spirit in the wilderness. And what I want to do this morning after my message is I want to call you to the, to the front here. I want to call you to, to just press in to seek the Lord for the Holy Spirit to anoint you, to fill you, to work in your life so that you will be sustained in your wilderness journeys. See, when you're going through the wilderness, when you're going through a season of lack, 
a season of privation, a season of difficulty. There are temptations. There are temptations to meet your own needs, to satisfy your flesh, to do what you want to do, and to get what you want when you want it instead, instead of waiting upon God. But I trust today that you will yield yourself to the presence of God and come before God and say, God, change me. How many of you know it's not about your spouse? How many of you know it's not about your, that person at work? It's not about your problem as much as it's about you. God, if God changes you on the inside, you'll view your problem differently. You'll view that person differently. You'll be able to work through it in a way that honors God and glorifies the Lord. And you will mature and you will develop. Amen? I believe we should all be in the spirit, even when we're in the wilderness. Someone who's in the spirit and out of the spirit every other day is not maturing in the faith. They're, they're affected by their circumstances. God does not want us to be affected by our circumstances, but he wants to grow, us to grow and to be like uh, John the Baptist in the Bible says, until his manifestation. In other words, until God opened the door for him, until God blessed him. Come on, promotion does not come from the east or the west, but promotion comes from the Lord. It's the Lord that lifts up one. Amen? So the question is, what can we learn in the wilderness? I believe that there are several lessons we can learn. The first lesson we can learn in the wilderness is humility. Humility. Look what the verse of Scripture says. This is the Lord. He said, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. God tested Israel. God humbled Israel in the wilderness and it was all preparation to bring them into the promised land. It was all part of the process because, listen, if you and I are not at the right place when our blessing comes, when our answer comes, we might not be able to handle it. You might get something too soon, too quick. And if you're not humbled, if you're not walking in a place of humility, that very blessing could become a curse in your life. Haven't you seen it in people's lives? where they get too much too soon and it actually ends up being to their detriment. The Lord said that he humbled Israel in the, wil in the wilderness. You know, the, we are, the truth of the matter is if we're enjoying success, humility usually isn't one of our greatest virtues that's present. But in the wilderness, humility can be discovered. You see, the Lord will humble to teach us, you know, and, 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 and you know, the reality of it is we don't like to uh, humble ourselves, but if you're a Christian this morning, if you want to follow what God's word says, the truth of the word, you understand that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Think about that this morning, how powerful that is. You know, and what's so tricky about it is because you have to understand that pride is not easily identifiable. Think about all the sins. Think about all the sins. You could identify them, right? You pretty much, you could know and identify all sins. But pride is sneaky. Pride is so subtle, you might not even know it's there and you could be full of pride. And then pride sets you up and makes you vulnerable for all other sins. So it really is something that, that we have to understand this morning that we have to deal with that. And, 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 and you can't even, you can't identify it in yourself. And sometimes you might think you're identifying it in someone else and you might be missing the mark. Sometimes someone might be very confident and you might say, oh, they're proud. But they're not. They're, they're confident in the Lord. And then you might see someone who's very, very meek and mild and, and they look like, oh, I'm just a worm and I'm just, and that's pride in reverse. That's not true humility. 
So it's, it's so critical that we get this because God is against, he's resisting the proud person, but he's giving grace to the humble. The Bible doesn't say God resists the adulterer. God resists the homosexual. God resists the, uh, you know, the drunkard or, or, no, 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 God doesn't, God resists, the only one he resists is the proud. Why? Because the proud person will not reach out their hand to receive God's grace. They are actually saying no to God. I can handle this. I can do this. I've done it. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. And what they do is they cut themselves off from the grace of God. What a, what a, what a sobering, what a dangerous place to be at. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God because it's not forever. You know what? Because God has said, you know what? If you humble yourself, I will, I will lift you up. I will. God, and that's what God was doing with Israel. He was, he was breaking them. He was humbling them. He was, he was beating, beating Egypt out of them so that he can bring them into the promised land and so that they could acknowledge and understand this was God's doing. This was God's doing. I was interviewing part of a credentials committee for the Assemblies of God, and, and we were interviewing a man for his credentials as a minister of the gospel. It's part of the, the process that the Assemblies of God has. There's a test, there's... Uh, references, there's a, uh, an, an oral uh, interview, an exam, and, and, and then this credentials uh, committee meeting. And, and this man, he told us his story, and he was a successful businessman. He, had, he was making over six figures. He lived in a big, beautiful house. He had, he had a business. I mean, he had it all going for him. And, and he was a Christian man, but he said that pride got a hold of him, and he lost everything. He lost it all. But you know what he said? He said this, and this was so powerful, and this was so profound. He says, but you know what? God used it to get a hold of my life. It was the wilderness for this man that God used in his life to get a hold of him and actually set him up and position him for greater blessing. Humility. It's one of the lessons we learn in the wilderness. And the more you walk with God, I believe if you are walking in, in the right path, you know what? You will grow in this grace of humility. What does Micah say? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. To walk humbly with your God. You've heard of John Newton. He is famous for writing Amazing Grace. The greatest hymn of the church, Amazing Grace. And he said this, When I get to heaven, there shall be three wonders there. The first, to see many people there whom I did not expect to see. The second wonder, to miss many people whom I did expect to see. And the third and greatest wonder of all will be to find myself there. Come on, that's humility. Secondly, what else do we learn in the wilderness? We learn community. The wilderness teaches us community that we, if we're going to make it through the wilderness, we do need other people. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than, the, than yourself. The Lord was speaking to the whole nation. This was something that they were to understand and, 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 and for them, uh, they, they were to learn community in the wilderness. Community simply is a modern term for an old-fashioned word or an ancient word called fellowship. Fellowship, that's... We get that word from the Greek word in the New Testament called, it's koinonia. And it's having all things in common around the person of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's, it's fellowship, you could call it fellowship, you could call it community. In the wilderness, you realize if you're going to make it through the wilderness, you need community. You need other people to make it through. Now, if you would think for a moment, 
through some of your wilderness experiences, how there have been people strategically positioned and God pl placed them there and blessed your life with a prayer at the right time, a phone call at the right time, uh, um, um, just a ministry, whether they took you out to eat or whether they visited you or, or whatever, but, but it was that, that, that community, that sense of community that, that ministered to you in your wilderness experience. You see, you know, in, in, in the wilderness, the, the harshness of the elements require help from others to survive. No one can make it without the help of others. You know, we, we as people of the Spirit, and we believe in miracles, and we believe, you know, all God has to do is speak it, and it's done. And we believe in miracles, amen? I'm reminded of the story of, of Jesus when he went to the house, to the home of Lazarus in John chapter 11. And uh, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Mary and Martha had hoped and had faith that Jesus would come and, and raise him up. And, and you know the story. Jesus came and, and the Bible says that he came to the graveside and he said, roll away the stone. And, and, and they said, you know, Jesus, he's been dead for four days and his body stinks and, you know, let's, let's not do that. And Jesus said, just roll away the stone. And then he lifted up his voice and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave. Now, what a miracle. I mean, this is, this is resurrection. I mean, it don't get any better than that. I mean, what greater miracle than a dead body, not just one day, two days, three days, but, but, but Jesus waited four days, and, and, and the, the belief and the understanding was that the body begins to decompose after three days. So, so this, was, this was a hopeless and a helpless situation, and Jesus raises him from the dead. Hallelujah, what a miracle. But notice something. What did Jesus say? To those that were around, he said, loose him and let him go. As great as the miracle was, Lazarus was still bound. And you know what? I believe that the Spirit of God raises people from spiritual death. Raises people up from their bondages, from their past, from their sin. And he raises them up and quickens their spirit. But the reality of it is, the community of faith is, needs to still be there to loose people and let them go. That's the work of the body of Christ. To be a part of taking away uh, the, the grave cloths. Taking away the old things. Taking away the things of death. And, and helping people come into that new life. Hallelujah. I thank God along the way. I've been walking with Christ since July 29th, 1981. But I, I understand this. I know this. I didn't do it in isolation. It was done in community. There were churches. There were fellowship. There were friends. There were mentors. There were people all around my life that helped me to get to this point. And you know what? The truth and the reality of it is, we never get to a point where I'm good. I don't need anybody else. I'm spiritual now. I got a degree in theology. I can speak King James language. Be thou and thouest. We never get to that point. We always need the community of faith. And why? Why does that become the biggest issue in the church? People get offended, people pull away, people get at odds with people. Why? It's, the, it's simple, the devil's strategy. It hasn't changed. Same in military conflict today. Divide and conquer. The reality of it is, you will get offended. The reality of it is, you will offend somebody else. Funny people get offended, they don't realize People told me you've offended them, so just get over yourself and get over it. I'm going to go on this side. You guys don't seem to be too friendly this morning. You know, someone once said that people come to church for two reasons, to meet God and to make a friend. Someone else said it this way. 
And I believe that's true. I believe that's true. Again, why? Because that is the simplicity of the gospel. That's the simplicity of, of, of who we are and what we've been created to be. Very simple. If you reduce it all, what did Jesus say? You know, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now listen, it's easy to say, oh, I love God. Oh, God knows my heart. I love him. You know, and I mean, you could, you could, you could, you could fake that. You could, you could play games with that. You could be real slick. Oh, I love the Lord. He know. Oh, God knows my heart. Don't judge me. God knows my heart. I won't let you see it, but he knows it. But you can't fake whether you love your neighbor. Because that's where the rubber meets the road. So now let me just say this. I'm going to throw a little curveball at you. Are you ready? It's not enough to be a friendly church. It's not enough to be friendly. You got to make friends. There's a difference. I get more uh, uh, compliments, if you will, good things said about our church from visitors, people out of state, new people, old people, across the board. What a friendly church. People are so friendly, and I believe we are, but that's not enough. I know it's early in the morning. It's tough to process this, this weighty matters, these philosophical concepts and constructs. But the reality of it is you could be friendly but not make friends. What does that mean? We're nice in church, but as soon as we go out the door, we go in all different directions. We never contact each other during the week. We don't have fellowship during the week. We don't have a cup of coffee. We're not calling. We're not caring for one another. We're not connecting with one another. We might have our little friends, but that's it. We don't open up that circle. And, and you might say, well, I'm not cliquish, but you might very well be because the only people you get with are the people you feel comfortable with, and they like you, you like them. It's us four no more. But, but if we're going to, it's not enough just to be friendly. We've got to make friends. That means you go out of your way. Think of, think of social media, how that actually has, has worked in reverse and, and broken down relationships. People don't know how to communicate face to face. They know how to do it, you know, because, because online you put your best foot forward and you don't put, you don't put that picture of what you look like when you wake up in the morning. I dare you, young ladies, I dare you, uh, some women, put that picture on uh, when you just woke up in the morning with no makeup, you didn't do your hair, but that's all we portray, in that. And, then, and everything we put on Facebook is, my son's the greatest, my daughter's the greatest, he's the smartest man, I mean, most good looking, I mean, he's got potential, he's the greatest, we all put that on Facebook, my husband's the best, my wife's the best, my house is the best, my church, everything's the best. How many best can you have? Everybody's the best. Because we're putting all that in and, 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 and instead of being real, hello? So, so what am I trying to say this morning? It's important to understand that, that we need to be a part of a community and, and to really, we have to, it's got, you've got to be intentional. Intentional on, on creating community. Do we really love one another? You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. Do you know that wasn't written just to be read at weddings? How many of you know 1 Corinthians 13 is not for marriage only? We only use that like 1 Corinthians 13. Oh, that's a good scripture to read at weddings. Uh, that's about marriage. It's not about marriage. Paul, if any, yes, it does apply to marriage, but it, it wasn't written for marriage. If anything, that was written in between... Uh, I'll give you some real deep uh, uh, hermeneutics. It was written between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. It's chapter 13. And you know what that's talking about? It's talking about in the context of the gifts of the Spirit in the church. It's talking about how are we to function in those gifts. And he says, you know what? I'll show you a more excellent way. The excellent way is the way of love. Whatever we do in the ministry and the gifts of the Spirit is for the edifying of the body and for the, for the love of of God to flow in our midst. So 1 Corinthians 13 was not written for a wedding. It was written for all of us in the body of Christ, and that's the way. And what does it say? Love must be patient. 
Oh, man. Try working in the parking lot and see how many people have love. <laughs> love must be kind. You cross that person in the pocket. See what happens. Love must be, thinks no evil, keeps no record of wrongs. You know what keeps no record of wrongs? It means it doesn't keep a little black book that she did this to me, he did that 48 years ago, 37 years ago, 22 years ago. Oh, come on. I'm trying to help you this morning. I know I'm hitting a chord because the reality of it is we keep records. I remember what he did. You know, uh, uh, I don't know if some different cultures, but us Italians, uh, I, I, I have some of my, my, my parents' uh, files and, and go back 60 years, 50 years, weddings. Who gave what at a wedding? That was the real black book. He gave such and such. I ain't given a penny more. I'm not even counting in inflation. I know it's 30 years later. They're still getting $10. We keep the records. And we do the same thing spiritually. He offended me. He's out. He's out. I'm going to talk about him. I'm going to smile in his face, but I'm going to backstab him. Love keeps no record of wrongs. How many of you are glad God doesn't keep a record of your wrongs? How many of you are glad that God doesn't remember what you did last month, 10 years ago, but God keeps no record? He, he, he casts them into the sea of forgetfulness. You see, we need to learn community. We all need that. We need to develop a culture in our church of encouragement. Some people, you might just have been brought up with negativity in your life. And that's a constant battle. That's why your mind needs to be renewed. You can't, you can't let your mind get in the rut of that kind of thinking. You're quick to be negative. You came from a negative family. Everything you look and you see it in a negative twist. What's his motive? Why did he do that? What is he up to? Hello? But we've got to develop a culture of encouragement. That we're encouraged. And you know what? It's not only in the church. This isn't just something we do this in our life. You know, uh, my wife and I, we went a few weeks ago. And we had breakfast at a place where the breakfast was great. The, the potatoes were hot. The eggs were hot. The toast was hot. Everything was good. It was delicious. So I called over the waitress. I said, can I talk to your manager, please? She looked at me. Uh-oh, the manager came over. Is everything all right? I says, you know what? I just want to say this breakfast was excellent. I blew her mind. Why? Because what is she used to? Complaining. Complaining. Oh, complaining. Oh, I didn't like the breakfast. I didn't like this, and I didn't like that, and blah, 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 and negativity, and miserable spirits. And, 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 and you know what? I just surprised her. The, the, the waitress was, was nervous and, and afraid. The, the manager was all... Then, then the other day, I just went with Pastor Mike. We went out for lunch at Cello's, and, and we had as our waitress, it was a... a, a, a Petra's daughter, they used to come when they were very young, uh, and, 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 and she's 21 years old. And what a friendly girl, you know. I just said, you know, it's so great to have a waitress that's so nice. And on the way out, you know what I did? I knew what I was doing. I, I, I knew I, this girl's a good girl, so I want to bless her. So I said to the manager, I said, you know that? I didn't tell her I knew her. I just said, you know that waitress? That waitress, she's an excellent waitress. She's friendly. She's a great, oh, thank you, sir. I, I, I'm glad to hear that. I'll let her know. But it's a culture, it's a mindset of encouraging. Just be an encourager. In the church, there's so many negative people. They come from, you know, maybe bad home life, bad church life somewhere else, and they come in, and they, and they have that same mindset, so they're very suspicious. Is the pastor going to be like that? Are the other church people going to be like that? And, and, and we get this negative. And if you hang around with people like that, what happens? It rubs off on you. But if we can start a revolution of encouragement, People will be drawn to us. If you're negative about, about, you're complaining about this in the church and that, who's going to want to come to your church? Hello? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Some of you need to smile, give your face a rest. Community, community. We need to see community amongst our young people, amongst our married couples. It needs to be a camaraderie. If, you, if your marriage is, is growing in strength, I'm not saying a perfect marriage. For you to mentor somebody does not mean you have to be an expert in that field. For you to mentor or coach anybody, all it means is you have to be a couple of steps ahead of them and say, listen, I've walked this terrain. I want you to, 
I want to teach you a couple things I've learned. So that means you could, you could even be a new Christian and you could help somebody else along in the journey just because you've learned a couple of things. Not to be proud, not to impress anybody, but just because you want to be a blessing. Think of the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. Our Father. Forgive us. It's not an individual. Our culture is individualistic. And, 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 and that comes into the church. We have to understand it's, it's, it's God's purpose that we would be blessed and, 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 and we're blessed corporately. Let me move on. The last one, and I close with this. The wilderness teaches us trust. How many of you remember, you have to be real old. No, not really. You have to be old. To remember Fanny Crosby's song, He Hideth Me in the Cleft of the Rock. Anybody remember that song? Brenda, you're not the oldest person in the church. How come you remember that song? She, she's like... <laughs> come on, if you're going to put it up, put it up. All right, all right. Well, anyway, that, that's an old song by Fanny Crosby. She was born blind and uh, uh, learned how to, 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 I mean, she just learned so much. She even became a teacher of the blind, an incredible Christian woman. And she wrote this song, He Hideth Me in the Cleft of the Rock. That picture was taken in the wilderness. That's the cleft of the rock. That's a place where you, you find refuge and protection from the wind, the storms, even, even hiding from the enemy. And, and you know what? The Lord is our trust. Oh, we, we put our trust in him. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. When you're facing hardship, disappointment, and pain, you could be, very, you could be shaken to the very core. And it's at those times we have to trust God, trust his plan, trust what he's doing. We might not understand what's going on in the wilderness. When, I, when, we, when we walked the wilderness in, in Beersheba, Beersheba, when we walked in that wilderness, as I was walking around, I understood how the Israelites could wander around for 40 years because you lose your bearings. When you're in the wilderness in your experience as a Christian in life, sometimes things get very monotonous. Sometimes things you know, don't seem to be happening in your life. Have you ever been there? where you're trusting God and you're waiting for that phone call where God is going to open a door, it's going to be an answer to a, a, a job uh, interview, it's going to be a, a, a blessing from a far country and you answer that phone and instead it's a bill collector. You know, or, or you're waiting for that, that check in the mail, that blessing in the mail. And you're waiting day after day after day. And then, and then one piece of mail comes and it looks like it's going to be a check, but, but it's those slick advertisements that make it look like it's personalized. But it's only some credit card company trying to trick you, trying to draw you in. And you see, it's at those times where you get so, so pained in your heart and so discouraged and you realize, am I going to keep on trusting God? God will allow us to find ourselves in circumstances where we're going to have to trust him. But that's a good place. To be at that place of saying, God, you know what? I'm trusting in you. Let me say this as we bring this to a close. When you, when you talk to God on a regular basis, when you're praying and reading the word and you're trusting him on a daily basis, you could have confidence that whatever twists and turns life takes, that you're in his will. Because you're trusting him. Because you're praying, you're seeking him, and he's your heavenly father. And he said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said, I will guide you with my eye. Meaning that God sees from his perspective. We only see one block at a time, one, one phase at a time. But God sees from an eternal perspective. And he will, he will guide us as he sees the future. He will guide our steps and direct us. Jesus said in John chapter 15, without me, you can do nothing. So we have to learn to trust in God this morning. Would you stand together with me, Rachel? Could you come back? I want us to sing that song, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. 
Holy Spirit, let me become more aware of your presence. Listen, I want to encourage you this morning to seek the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit. God wants to minister to you. He wants to minister to me. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, you might be in a wilderness. You might be going through a, a difficult season of life. John the Baptist was in the Spirit, was in the wilderness, and the Spirit moved upon him. The Spirit moved upon him in the wilderness. And then he came out, and God had positioned him to be a voice, to be a blessing. I want you to understand something. Your wilderness is not meant to, to destroy you. It's meant to prove you, to test you, that God might bring you out to rich fulfillment, that God might bring you out to a greater place of blessing. As we begin to sing this, I want you to come forward. I want you to take a few moments to just seek God. Just reach out to the Lord. Just worship God this morning. Just say, Holy Spirit, come fill me. Holy Spirit, come refresh me. I need you. I'm in the wilderness. I need, I need rivers of living water. The Lord said, even in the wilderness, I'll cause streams, rivers of water to flow. Come on, let's seek God. Let's seek God as we sing this. Spirit. You're a living Come on, people that see God's Holy Spirit this morning. His presence. In your presence. Your presence. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Hallelujah. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of
I want to pray for you personally. I want to just come into agreement and pray with you. But I want your expectation not to be like that little boy who was just keeping the seven-inch fish and throwing away the big ones because all he had was a small container. Come on, we, we need to have an expectation of being filled with the Holy Spirit, an expectation of being filled with the presence of God. This morning, we need more of God's presence. I think we've, we've kind of settled for just a little bit, a little trickle, when Jesus said, whoever believes in me, out of their innermost being shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. Come on, would you believe God as I pray with you? Would you believe for a river, a season of refreshing, a blessing, an outpouring of the Spirit? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.